All right, welcome to the product. Meal planning is important because it prevents us from being a disappointed wreck when dinner time comes around and we have no clue what to make or even if we have the ingredients to make the meal. It's a time and a money saver, but most importantly, it frees up valuable brain space. Creating a meal plan prepares us for the week to come and gives us peace of mind that we're organized and can feed ourselves and our family. That's why I do it and that's why Plan to Eat helps me do it. Your subscription includes access to the Plan to Eat website and fully featured mobile apps on iOS and Android. And Plan to Eat gives you the tools to clip and organize recipes from any website, the ones your family loves and that fit your dietary preferences and needs. And you can create a meal plan around your schedule. Then what happens is the Plan to Eat software automatically creates an organized shopping list based on your plan. So sign up for your free trial at plantoeat.com slash timecrafting. That's plantoeat.com forward slash timecrafting. The coupon will be automatically applied to your account and can be used when you're ready to subscribe. It's valid for new customers only. Give Plan to Eat a try today. Activityist podcast. I am Mike Vardy, your usual host and uh, podcast, uh, you know, MC and, and ringmaster and ringleader. And uh, we are heading into a brand new calendar year. Now, you all know that I'm I'm kind of the fan of you can start the year you want anytime you want, hence the front nine and stuff like that. But I've got uh, a guest with me this week who is uh, also very adept at helping people kind of craft and shape the year that they want, uh, especially a great year. They want a great year. I've got David Delp from Pilot, from Pilot Fire here with me this week. Uh, David, thanks for joining me. Hey, Mike. Thanks a lot. So, David, uh, I had a chance to meet you at Simple Rev this year. Uh, and uh, Joel, uh, Joel Zobzlowski and Daniel Hayes, Dan's been on the show, actually, uh, this event that they put together where we talk about simplicity and, and the <laughs> or simple living and, and all things surrounding that. And one of the things we got a chance to do afterwards, um, I'll talk a little bit about the actual the talk because I thought that was a, a interesting as well. But afterwards, we all hung out at the end of the event. And then as the crowd dispersed, we remained and the crowd continued to disperse <laughs> and we still <laughs> remained. And at the end of the night, it was four of us, me, you, Brooks, and uh, Dr. Steve Taubman were just sitting there. We were just having a really great time just chatting about the things that we, not just the, like the, the productivity and simplicity and all this stuff, but just like, you know, um, magic and, and things like that. Like we were talking about a whole bunch of awesome things. So um, I got to really know you then. Um, and and I, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about what you, you know, what you do what pilot fire is, and then I want you to get into this whole great year thing that that you're you're putting on in, in San Francisco. Sure, yes, that was a great way to meet. And Simple Rev was uh, a very intimate, very um, focused uh, conference that for me was mostly about intentional living. And I do like the idea of simplicity, but it's not generally how I run my life. Mm. I I do think very much about how I can live more intentionally. And, and it is one of the main focuses of pilot fire is living intentionally and building, um, all your decisions around making a life you believe in. And in order to do that, you have to figure out what you believe in. And in my way of thinking, the only way you can figure that out is trying things out. And sometimes that means failing. And I think one of the things you might remember is that at the beginning of my talk, I had people try to reappropriate the idea of failure. And mm. instead of cringing and feeling bad about failing, I propose that if you aren't failing, you aren't actually trying things that are that hard or that interesting and that we should actually celebrate our failures. And this is this is this is a time of year where people are really looking back at what happened and they, they tend to be more susceptible to the, oh, my year didn't go the way I, I hoped or I screwed this up or I failed at that. And, yeah, I think that that's a really valid point is that, yes, we need to um, celebrate our successes and acknowledge the failures we have. But don't don't get discouraged by them. I guess use them as teaching moments, right? Well, they are teaching moments. They're certainly learning moments. They're things that you tried that didn't work. And if you can just think of it that way, the classic Edison response to, you know, how about those those 10,000 things you tried that didn't turn into a light bulb? And he said, uh, you know, those aren't failures. Those are 10,000 things I found out didn't work. Yeah. And I think we spend a lot of our lives doing things over and over again that we've already tried that didn't work. And we keep trying them again. And part of living intentionally is just being able to face your disappointments and being able to face even the things that you are proud of. 
and letting them go and seeing them as as little experiments. Some of them work, some of them don't. And the more you know, learn about what works, you can start to build, I guess, your your momentum around ideas that you want to try again. Right. Now, now one of the things I noticed during your talk, first off, it was uh, I showed up on the second day. Uh, and you were there. You were there for the whole thing at Simple Rare, right? You were there for both days. Sure, I was. So I, I came in for the second day, and you were on. I think two talk. Were you? On, you were on right before me. That's right. And it was one of those things where I'm watching and I'm going. And we, it, it was great to see someone who you know was talking about the stuff you were talking about, and, and a lot of it resonated with me to the point where I'm like, hmm, there are things in my talk that I may have to sco- sculpt a little bit differently. <laughs> <laughs> which is always advantageous and then you had the and i know i, I kind of poked fun but you had the um the the uh index cards with the oh, yeah, binder yeah, clips yeah. yeah yeah and i referred to and, and anyone who's listening to the show that's listened to me for a while and knows my writing knows that you know i would refer to those as hipster pdas merlin man's thing but uh-huh. you hadn't heard of that right you just said no these are my my index <laughs> cards with binder clips and it was and it was it was funny because during the presentation I would say or those hipster PDAs and, and you from the crowd was like or just index cards with binder clips. <laughs> so so we each had a bit of a of fun with that. But one of the things I really liked about first off, one of the, the big things I liked was paper. The fact you use paper. And Patrick Roan, who was on last week, he's a big paper fan. Just like I I love using I love the tactile aspect of it. I love using paper as a gateway. I, obviously there's digital tools and I know that you use digital tools as well but what but the other thing that i really liked was the idea of roles like looking at your roles and your go- and using that as kind of I, i'm going to say guide like guiding not guiding principles but like kind of uh things that you can use that will help propel you in the right direction is is that fair to say what that that's one of the things that you tend to tend to try to um uh you know, pass on to people is, Hey, look, you know, look at your roles and see how, how you make those, how, how the things you put in there, how they, how they work and how they can propel you forward. Let me, let me back up a little bit. Sure. And that's absolutely true. Let me back up and just say that you asked a question that I might, I think would help set the context is, which is that uh pilot fire is a website where I write a lot and describe a system that I use and teach called a simple system for everything. Right. And there are four components to this, which, um, and there are many, but the, the four basic components are that you learn how to, um, categorize your needs and desires and your actions into roles. Like you just said. So as a father, I behave very differently than I do as a creative director in front of a bunch of designers, which is very different than I behave when I'm a performer singing a song. And that's very different than my role as a community activist or as a gardener or as an ex-husband or as a brother. And what I've found is, and I'll get back to roles in a minute, but when you, you can break down your roles, your your desires into roles, it's much easier to focus your intentions. And I think that, uh, let me get back to roles in a minute, but once you decide what your roles are, you can start to um, define your goals. So goals are a little easier to work with. And I don't think of goals necessarily as achievements I want to accomplish. And I think of goals fairly differently, which is, They're just tools to help you focus. Mm. And if you, in your roles, know what's most important to you, goals help you focus on what's most important to you. And I think more importantly than achieving goals is focusing on on what's most important to you and losing yourself into a state of of flow, a state of complete immersion. And so you have your roles, you have your goals, and then I uh, have a method for planning your week just five to six to seven goals based on your roles. And this is based on Stephen Covey's Mm -hmm. methods that he describes in First Things First. And then finally, uh, your day's plan, which is how do you craft your day so that you're prioritized doing the most important things first. And I have three by five cards that I use for all of those. So that's the simple system right there. It's, it's, one of the things I talk about with people is I talk about context. You and I have had this conversation before where, where I say, you know, context kind of are those things that add value to your tasks. Mm-hmm. Whereas, um, but roles um, are something that people can 
if they connect with their roles better in my mind, and this is just me, me spitballing here, then they're going to be able to better understand what they need to do to live up to their fullest potential within those roles. Does that sound about right? Yeah, let me put it a little bit differently. Sure. Uh, context has to do a lot with your physical location and the activity you might be participating in, but it doesn't necessarily uh, help you understand your motivation. Yeah, in the in the traditional sense, that's what contexts are. I mean, we I think a lot of us are trying to stretch that, mm -hmm. uh, especially those who are GTD followers, because right. GTD is all about like this is where you are. You know, I think we're seeing more people say, "Well, I don't connect with." I mean, my desk. Who cares? I'm at my desk all the time. Like that's that doesn't right. really help me. Whereas roles, if you used roles as context, I, I'm just saying I'm just saying this as an example. Then you could. I mean, roles can fit into. I guess my point is, is that while context add value to a task by telling you where you need to be or what state you need to be to accomplish them, roles give you a much higher sense of, of value. Does that make I sense? Think, absolutely. I think that that's what makes them so powerful. And there, I have a few examples I can tell you. One, mm -hmm. one of them is sort of humorous, which is... Uh, I when I moved to my last place, um, it was an old Victorian house, and it had a lot of repairs that needed to be done. And this was early on when I was starting to understand the power of roles. And I had listed as one of my roles a homeowner, and I had a list of projects that I wanted to to do. And we had a a wall heater in the in the hallway, which. Mm was very good at heating the wall across from it. <laughs> and and it was not good at heating the rest of the house. And it was on my list to get central heating. And I'd heard about a guy who might be able to come in. And because we were on the bottom floor, it seemed like it was going to be a pretty simple project. But it kept getting put off every week. Because in my role as a homeowner, you know, I don't really look for making a big investment out of my property. I don't think of it as property so much. Mm. And and yet there was one night when I was getting ready for bed, and I looked over at my wife, and she was tucked under the covers up to her nose. And I looked at her, and I said, you know, would I get to see you naked more if our <laughs> heater was... <laughs> if our heater was installed? And she just nodded. And no lie, I switched it from homeowner to husband slash lover. And within three weeks, we had central heating. <laughs> and the, I know this sounds funny and a little risque, but the thing is, uh, understanding my role completely changed my motivation mm -hmm. for doing that task. And it also helped me understand a, a couple other things. I say husband slash lover. But when I work with people and I look at the roles they have with their partner, I say, you know, you have several roles you play with them. And a husband is a very different role than a lover. And if you look at your week and you're planning your week and you say, okay, as a husband, I'm going to clean out the garage so my wife can get the car in it and that'll be a really sweet thing I can do for her. But as a lover, it's a totally different motivation what right. can i do to make my wife feel like the sexiest woman in the world or my husband or whomever is my lover and so i started breaking those roles out and the other role that i pulled out was instead of homeowner which is somebody that feels like and then there's a lot in a name when you talk about your role instead of a homeowner which feels like an investor somebody who is is taking care of a property i switched that to homemaker and when I thought on a large scale, like, who am I as a homemaker? The idea was, oh, I want a home where things smell good, where people feel like they can rest, where people feel like they can have lively conversations and play music. And as soon as I had that idea of what a homemaker was, my motivations for those other projects of like clearing out the living room, and I did within a couple of months, and having a performance there with friends uh, uh, who came in and sang, all of a sudden I was making a home, and the mm. idea of fixing a window in the back wasn't nearly as important. I put a piece of cardboard up and painted a little picture on it, and that worked for the winter, winter but 
clearing the living room out and making a stage, that was, I was so excited. And I, what happened is it funneled me into that state of flow. I really was connected to something that felt important to me and, and I got a lot done. Now, one of the things that, that I, I really like about the simple system that you put together is that it allows you to focus on defining your roles. Mm-hmm. Most people get caught up in the day-to-day, you know, the to-do list. And the to-do list really, it just becomes a laundry list, right? Whereas when you have a – and this is why really complex task management systems really flummox me. I mean, I can figure them out. But I don't like to pass them on to people because they spend more time – trying to wrap their head around the the tool than the reason that they need the tool in the first place. Do you know what I mean? So, Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah I mean, in a simple system for everything, the, when you have your roles um, and you're, it, it does take a long time to gain depth in your sense of those roles. Like, like I said, it took me a couple of months to redefine my roles till I found what was really motivating me. But every week, I take 20 minutes to plan my week. And every morning, um, and I'm somebody who struggles with anxiety, and taking two minutes to plan my day and prioritize it relieves the anxiety, and it gives me a sense of, oh, I know really actually what's important for me to focus on today. And it's all on a three-by-five card. You know what? I, I You just mentioned the word depth. And that to me is so critical when it comes to, I mean, I'll throw out the word productivity, but like it it, it just, because most people think about the now, right? Like this is what's going on right now, but they don't think beyond that. So way too far ahead, right? They go, okay, well, this is what I have to get done today or by the end of the day, Mm -hmm. but they don't dig deep into why that stuff is the stuff they have to do. Or why is it even on their list in the first place? And they don't look beyond as to, well, why is this stuff on my list? Like, what, what, what is the end? What, what, like, of, of, if I do this thing, what does that mean to me five years down the road? Like, you know, I mean, you're going to get to that point where you look at this stuff and it, it, it does that make sense? Like, I don't think a lot of people oh, yeah. look, dig deep, you know? Well, I think the one of the issues, again, is that when we ask the question, why? Uh, it feels fairly undirected, and I love the question why. And it's really a good thing to ask every once in a while, like, why am I doing this? Why am I really doing this? And it's an unending question. Well, if I'm doing it for that reason, then why am I doing that? Um, But the great thing about roles that helps you focus, again, the questioning about why is is to say, well, as a father, Mm. why am I doing this? And I, I have a few exercises that I have people go through. One of them is uh, imagining um, my daughter. So when you take a role as a father, I say, well, what is really important to me to, to, be, to do as a father? And what would I want my daughter to say about me when I'm at my best? Like, what would, what would she say about me? And I remember having a fairly profound, very small moment realizing, and I wrote it down, you know, as a quote from her, uh, as a father, my dad gave me a rich life where I felt strength or uh, felt safe and found my own strength. And it was so simple. It's like, oh, wow. So give her opportunities, give her opportunities to fail and help her find her strength, which as a father of a daughter was a giant uh, like beacon to follow. Will this help her feel strong? And that's the why. It's like I'm doing this because it'll help my daughter feel strong. And she's 17 now. I just wrote her a letter describing uh, how we're going to fund her college and and how she might start managing that money. And it is still totally goes back to that why question. Why am I doing this? I want to help my daughter feel strong. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and it was so motivating this week to sit down and spend, and it's hard to sit down and write an, for an hour and a half on the subject of financial management <laughs> <laughs> for your daughter. But if the motivation was as a as a father, I want her to find her own strength. It's it's been 
hugely helpful to think of that in terms of my role. It's it's, it's funny. I think I've started to to look at things in this lens a lot more because my we at my wife's Christmas party, it was a the whole family got to go, uh, and they were doing karaoke. And my daughter loves singing absolutely, and she's really good. Like she she's taking after me in terms of like just performing. Mm-hmm. And she got up on stage, and the car- songs she likes are the songs. And she listens to the clean versions of all these songs. But, you know, popular music nowadays is even more, um, let's say, there's more innuendo in it than even we had, right? Sure. And so she sings the song Fancy. And we're listening, and she's doing a great job. But in karaoke, you can see the words on the screen. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking at the words, I'm going, oh, those things she sang <laughs> as a nine going on 10-year-old are probably not things that I would necessarily want her to to say, mm-hmm. but by the same token, look at her up there. She's owning it. She's totally owning it. But she also, we've had the discussion where it's like, you know, these words, she goes, no, I know these words are bad. And I know, you know, she has an understand, a general understanding of what some of it means, not, mm-hmm. not an over, over, you know, overarching understanding, but enough to know that she's not, I mean, she was in a safe place where she could do that. No one was giving her a hard time. And, and if anyone... This is one thing my wife and I, if anyone jumped up and judged us by saying, how dare you let her sing? I would have just said, look, get out of here. Like, right, you know, right. so because the most important thing for me in that moment was watching my daughter on stage, like sing her heart out oh, and, yeah. and feel super confident in front of everybody and the applause she got and all that. And there was another girl that was in the restaurant and she was classically trained as a vocalist. And she goes, oh, you know, um, your daughter's really good. I'm like, yeah, I know. I know, you know. I said, I didn't take vocal training as a kid, and I know if I did, I'd probably be, be you know, even better. And she, she says, well, I know a few vocal teachers, so if you're interested. so, And that's the thing is that uh, I'm at the point where I just asked her. I said, do you want to take vocal training? But I was like, not right now. I'm like, okay. Yeah, <laughs> you know? Right, right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I just want to sing for fun, and that's cool. But the fact that I, I think that, the, again – I could have been that guy that got up and went like, oh, you're grounded or da, 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 or how dare you sing that? Or no, you can't go up and sing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I let her have that freedom as did my wife. And it, it I mean, she had a blast, absolute blast. In fact, I left with my son cause he was too tired and my wife and my daughter stayed until the thing closed down. Like that's how much fun they were having. So I think that, that if you have a strong bond and you, again, that role that knowing what, you know, having that, heightened awareness because that's what a lot of people lose because they're spending so much time in this like go 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 do 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 that they don't mm-hmm. focus on the bbb right you know what i mean yeah. um it, not even bb it just it should just be a b it's not <laughs> even a whole bunch of being it's just like this is what this is um but i want to talk to you before we jump into the, the 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 workshop you're doing which i think is fantastic is you have we we're in a mastermind together and we've mm-hmm. had some chances to chat and one thing that i find you're really good at doing um is you are good at breaking patterns. You are good at, if someone is saying something, and you do it in a way that isn't like curt. It's it's um, it's a skill. It's, and you're not even, you're, you're just like, oh, hold on a second. And you, let, and you let the person finish out, which I think is fantastic. And then you say, <laughs> okay, but, what, but what, what, what does that mean? Or what is that? And, it, you know, you won't put up with the, well, I just told you what it is. No, you didn't. <laughs> you know, so uh, how how important is breaking patterns when it comes to, this does relate to the whole building a great year. How important is breaking both patterns or, you know, uh, let's say n- surface beliefs when it comes to like going forward and building the year that you really want? Yeah, I think that uh, uh, there, I've always have at least two ways to look at, this idea of patterns because um on one hand everybody wants to break their bad habits and they think if only i break this habit that would be that would i would be a better person uh and and i think that they are in some ways much much harder to break when you just see them as as patterns you you have to break on on the other hand if you think of uh yourself as as a year as 52 little experiments once a week that you can take and instead of trying to break a pattern you can think of it as let me try something new just this once one little thing this week i want to try something new and the patterns do come from stories we tell ourselves and stories that have to do with the roles we think we should play 
And so the habits, the things we do that we are, uh, the actions we take that baffle us, I think of those as shadow roles. I think of those as roles that we are bringing along with us um, from our past that w- were really, really useful in the past, but we're bringing them to a situation that isn't working right now. So one example is um, uh, I'm pretty good at looking at systems and seeing what's wrong and being the smart aleck in the room that tells everybody that the system is wrong and that <laughs> and here's how to fix it. And I did this professionally for many years, and I realized this is a pattern that I had developed young when I really needed it as a survival skill, is to walk into a group and say, this, is, this group is messed up. I need to get out of here. Or I, if I'm going to be involved in this group, I need to know how to fix this issue. And I became either the hero that fixed things or the person who, who knew how to survive when other people were flailing. Right. And that was a very powerful role. But to walk into a boardroom or to walk into a, a conference room with people who are new to each other, or struggling to get something done, to be the guy that points out the problems is a, is is the wrong guy to be. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and it took me a while to realize this is a shadow role I have that I'm sort of signing up to be um, in a role – that's inappropriate. And people have these shadow roles. They have the martyr role. They have the naysayer role. They have, and a lot of them are based on fear. And I think that if you look at your roles and you start looking at the story you tell yourself unconsciously or even consciously in certain situations, you will start to realize, ooh, that's not quite fitting. And then the question becomes, okay, what's something new I can do in that same situation? Like I'm in an argument in a confrontation. It's the same old argument I'm in all the time. What's the one thing I can shift this week? And it makes it small when you say this week. And mm-hmm. you say one thing to do this week that will maybe make a difference. And in confrontations, it's often all it takes is one small shift. And so to answer your question, that is one way to break habits. Sometimes there are habits around procrastination. Sometimes there are habits around... Uh, you know, getting caught in the same routine. If you have a client, ah, oh, I did that again. Yeah. Um, and and so my the way I think about a simple system for everything is that the most important thing you can do is plan every week, and you plan three or four or five things that experiments that you're going to do that will make a difference in your life, and some of them only take five minutes. And that's a great plan when you have like five, five minute experiments that are the most important thing you can do that'll give you your best shot at having a great week. And, and surely people have 25 minutes in their week yeah. to make that yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, I, I want to translate that out to a great year. Sure. It, I was going to say, I, yeah, let's talk about that. So there's a slightly different filter for this. When, I, I did this at Simple Rev, um, and one of the ways you look at what you want to do f- over the year um, is to take a simple activity that I call Before I Die. And you say, Before I Die, I want to. And before you do that, though, you think of a role. So again, it's like, as a father, before I die, I want to travel to a distant land with my daughter. I mean, that's, that's mine this year. And, and then I say after that, and this year I will. Mm. And, and last year, the thing I did for her was sponsor a road trip for her and a friend. And I didn't get to go away with her, but it was in that vein of both giving, uh, giving her rich opportunities, helping her find her strength, but it was totally towards turning into her into a traveler and giving her that sense of adventure because for her, her independence was more important than hanging out with her dad. Right. So um, I do remember, and so every year, the way I plan a year is I start with that question in each role. Uh, what is it that I want to do before I die? So as an entrepreneur, what do I want to do before I die? As a designer, what do I want to do before I die? As a teacher, as a singer, as a as a lover as a brother and 
the great year workshop after we do uh dispel with last year which is a whole other ritual um we start with that what are the core things that we want to do before we die and it is not a bucket list these are not things that would be neat to do these are things that you would set aside big chunks of your life in order to do Mm. and when you're given that question people have different responses some people are like oh i've got too many and that's fine there's a process for filtering down to find the things that are really, really vital and that you want to start on. And there are other, as another response, which is, gosh, I don't even know where to start. And that's where roles come in, where you say, oh, well, are you a good friend? Oh, yeah, I'm a darn good friend. Okay, well, think of one of your best friends. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, as a friend, what's one thing you know you want to do before you die? It's like, oh, wow, well they're really struggling with Alzheimer's and uh, I just want to make sure I set them up, uh, get them get them set up for a good life after that. It's like, wow, that's a big goal. Well, is there something you know you could do this year for that? Actually, there is something I'm doing this year for that. Oh, what is it? Okay, now we have a conversation. Yep. Right? Yeah. And we have, we to, for somebody who thought they didn't know what they wanted to do, now it's really obvious they have their heart in it. So the Great Year Workshop that I hold every year is um, a group of people that gets together. Sometimes it's 30 people. Sometimes it's 10 people. Uh, Right now I have about eight people signed up, but I haven't advertised it much. Um, But it's a a day-long workshop that starts off with that premise of we're going to build lives we believe in, and we're going to start with what is so vital to us and – and uh, I think I sang this song at Simple Rev, which is this basic idea of I may not accomplish everything I want to accomplish, but before I die, I will know I lived. Yep. I will know I did my best. And It's never fun to go out after somebody sings, by the way. Just so <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That was a very big compliment, by the way. I felt very <laughs> happy. I, you are a, a much more seasoned speaker than I, and to have you come up and tell me, damn, I did not want to go on after you, <laughs> made me very happy. So thank you for that. So when it, so the workshop is when, uh, just so we can let our listeners know, because there are going to be some people listening in the area, because it's taking place in San Francisco, right? It's in San Francisco, but I have somebody flying in from Portland, somebody flying in from New Mexico, and... Uh, It's in San Francisco. Um, It's in the Mission District in a very cool place, a very neat performance art space that is also very cozy and um, just tuned for creativity and focus. Uh, And it's on January 24th. Um, It's called the Great Year Workshop. And uh, and I say that because with all of the kinds of plans – that I help people create a week's plan, a day's plan or a project plan or a year's plan. The idea is I'm going to write down what I think is my best shot at having a great year. I'm going to be now a year goes on and things change. You had mentioned early on, like how do you have a plan last in the way you have a plan last is because you visit it regularly. Mm -hmm. And the way you visit it regularly is you have it be simple enough that you can carry it around in your back pocket. And that's what I do. You know, the three by five cards is I have my year's plan on my three by five cards and I'm flipping through it right now. And they're like six things that I have not done out of the 20 no, now, now, now we're now we're recording this before December thirty first. Oh so, yeah, yeah. So you still I, got you still got time. People are going to be like, "What? He didn't do these things." No, he still has time. <laughs> well, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this that goals. The primary purpose of a goal is not so that you will accomplish it. Now, that's not totally true. It is does feel good sometimes to accomplish it, but we don't know how accomplishing our goals will make us feel. We have these weird brains that just cannot figure out how we will feel in the future. And when we do accomplish goals, often it doesn't feel as good as we thought it would. But, like I said earlier, writing down your goals and spending your time understanding your roles and what's important to you and using them, crafting them, these goals so that they help you focus, 
smaller and smaller goals so that the moment I sit down to start working on my big goal, I actually know the tiniest small step that will engage me fully in what is most important to me. That is when the magic happens. That is when you are fully engaged, you lose a sense of yourself, you time disappears, and you're in what's called a state of flow. And to me, and evidence would point out, that is what makes you happy. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. so, so David, where can people learn more about the workshop and also where can people find you online? Uh, pilotfire.com is the best place to find out about all of this. And the workshop is simply at pilotfire.com slash great year. Awesome. Now, I'll be speaking to you later this week when we have our mastermind, but uh, I also want to thank you for joining us uh, this week on the Productivityist Podcast. Totally my pleasure. It was really a great time. Thank you, Mike.